novelist Matt Haig has written award-winning, greatly celebrated books for children and adults. His memoir, Reasons to Stay Alive, a number one bestseller, read all over the world, has been adapted for the stage and will be performed on this studio floor in about two hours. Um, it's a deeply honest... I've just seen it. Have you? It's, it's all right? Good. Yeah, it's okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, it's, it's an edifying human and often humorous account of a personal battle with depression with the discovery of so many reasons to stay alive. Other books for grown-ups include award-winning The Radleys, The Humans and Notes on a Nervous Planet, which is a personal favourite of mine that I break into intermittently throughout the week. Susan Kalman, award-winning comedian, yes. actor, right. television presenter and podcaster, yeah. writer and panellist on a number of our favourite shows, including Mock the Week, QI and The News Quiz. Yeah. Her podcast, Mrs. Brightside, which is a personal favourite of mine, um, in which she cheerfully takes on depression with her friends, was rated one of The Guardian's top 50 podcasts. It was. Uh, <laughs> it was. The we BBC cancelled it, but it was. <laughs> We're doing it again anyway without them. <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, her memoir, Cheer Up Love, describes with humour and honesty her experiences of depression, how she came to embrace both her capacity for spreading joy as well as the darker side. Susan also made it all the way to week 10 on Strictly. I did, yes, I did. did. That, was a, that was remarkable. I think all that always just shows that the British public have a great sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so I think you can tell that this event is going to take the form of a relaxed conversation. Um, about 50 minutes, ladies and gents, and then perhaps 10 minutes worth of any questions that you may have for Susan or Matt. So you've um, both detailed in your writing and in interviews and podcasts, all the things in the arts that you love that have helped you, mm. perhaps, or maybe just brought a bit of joy. <clears throat> Films and documentaries uh, being one of them. What is it about certain shows in those catalogues that we could just watch over and over and over again, do you think? Can I oh, start? Right. Yes, sure, no problem at all. I'm trying Thanks. to remember what I Thanks, said in Matt. my... No. Um, no, I don't remember anything <laughs> I've said. Did, did, did you get some questions through beforehand? Um, no, I just, it was a general description thing, so yeah. we'll just go for it. Okay, it's absolutely fine. I've <laughs> built a career on not knowing what I'm doing. So, <laughs> um, For me, I said in Cheer Up Love that I measured my depression in box sets that if I was feeling okay, then it was a British drama. And if I wasn't, it was an American, because American dramas are always 26 episodes. So the West Wing ah. is a bad time. <laughs> Line of duty, I'm doing okay. <laughs> so, and I, I, television and film are, are, is my go-to happy place, without question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, at the moment, for example, I'm watching Benidorm on Netflix. I bloody love Benidorm, it's amazing. Um, and I'm very, one of my major things in life is against cultural snobbery, that whatever it is you enjoy, you should never be ashamed of enjoying it. Um, and there's a lot of snobbery about, oh, you watch this or that. So for me, the things I always return to, uh, Prime Suspect, Helen Mirren, mm. yeah. nothing better. Mm -mm. Ever. <laughs> I could watch that again and again and regularly do because it's just the best television series of all time, in, in my view, and a brilliant female protagonist. And film wise, if I'm feeling down, I always watch Tootsie. I know. Tootsie's, ah. Tootsie's a real go to for me because it's funny and it's very strange. Oddly enough, Dustin Hoffman is wanting to be a woman who has the same problems I do. He wishes he was more attractive. And so it's quite strange because mm. Dustin Hoffman actually articulates how I feel presenting television shows. Because <laughs> he goes, I just wish I was more attractive. <laughs> but it's very funny as well. So I, I go to those kind of places, but TV and film for me is really a place I go to yeah. to escape from things. Yeah, definitely for me. Um, my most recent bout of depression, I got out of i think partly um this was about three years ago because i started watching game of friends <laughs> i'd never watched game of friends it was like series five at that point and then i just watched like five series of game of thrones i sort of went off it at series five but it did pull me out of um a sort of depression anxiety patch but if i went really back to when i was super ill i used to watch friends a lot yeah because i didn't have any <laughs> and I was agoraphobic, so I could pretend 
I had a social life mm. with those people <laughs> um, <That's laughs> on yeah. the sofa. No, it's true. Uh, yeah. I'm a, you know, I'm, um, yeah, because I, I, friend, Friends comes into a little bit of stick now, but it's still, it's still the most watched yeah. TV, even in the age, the golden age of television that we're meant to be in now with Netflix, everything is still the most watched TV show worldwide. Possibly for the reasons that you're describing. Yes, because every, everyone's get lonelier and sort of, yeah. But also the thing about Friends is you can start watching an episode of Friends at any point and it doesn't matter. Do you just mean it's yeah. a really it's a really great one, especially yes. if you're if you're slightly depressed and anxious and your attention span's gone. You don't need an attention span it's really true. for friends, <laughs> do you? Because no. it's the same you know who they are and you know what's gonna happen. And it's almost I feel like friends, it's almost like that's what it is. It's like if you haven't got any friends, you press the button that says friends and that's <laughs> your <laughs> that's your delivered friends <laughs> and that's why it's the most sort of popular thing because it's kind of like an amazon of friends yeah. or deliveroo of <laughs> friends <laughs> and i have to say i also i've got an obsession with um, british cr with crime drama mm -hmm. it's agatha christie's i mean i could watch poirot's all day because i think in a world where there are no solutions yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. you know at the end of it you're going to find out who did it and it's the most complete, psychologically, it sounds very odd. At the moment, I'm watching um, Law and Order Special Victims Unit, which is not the most cheerful. <laughs> but at the same time, something happens, they investigate it, someone gets done. Yeah. And you watch it, and it's a complete yeah. thing. And I, I love shows that, there we go, in 45 minutes, I find out who did it, who did it and it, it's a complete thing. For my brain, I enjoy yes. conclusions. And also thrillers, I think, are weirdly comforting because mm -hmm. uh, you know, even the violent ones are quite comforting because you think, well, I'm having a bad day, but I'm not tied up in the boot of a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's getting me through just now? Yeah. You're genuinely getting me through <laughs> just now, and this is absolutely true. Jason Statham. <laughs> Uh, because I was like, oh, the world's just gone to shit. This is awful. <laughs> I thought, I've never seen any Jason Statham films. And I watched one where he's like stripped naked, punching people. He's covered in machine oil. Mm. And he's just punching people and he's driving cars really Transporter. fast. Transporter. Transporter. And I thought, this is going to get me through. So <laughs> I've been watching every Jason Statham film I can get my hands on. I'm a pacifist. Yeah. But I love watching a, a rough guy punch a man. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, you know what I, mean? I love it. Have you seen the John Wick films? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I like that them. does it for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to see a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what you're saying is it it, 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 it's different different times require different measures. Like Tootsie, it's something, it's something to do with empathy. Things like friends, yeah. something to do with it's, uh, the, the the kind of life that you that you want to have with the kind of people you want to have it with. And then Jason, just to beat the... the yeah. Sometimes you just want a bit of escapism. Yeah, yeah. that's know. what Game of Thrones was for me because it had no bearing on reality whatsoever. Yeah. So when I was like depressed, it, you know, because even so, you, you, you find any connection, if, you, if you've got depression, you find any connection that's relating to your life that can make you feel worse. And Game of Thrones had nothing mm -hmm. that was real. So all the threat and danger and violence, it had... You, you were distanced mm. from it and yeah. you could sort of absorb yourself into another world. So I can't do meditation. I can't lie on the floor and do meditation, but I can watch really violent things <laughs> on television. <laughs> it's, that. a very, it's, it's really interesting because, and this is the thing, we were talking about this beforehand, about both of us have written about our own depression mm. and we never ever say this is your solution because everyone has their own solution. So, I cannot meditate and do all that. And people keep saying to me, you should meditate and do mindfulness. And my brain doesn't work. Like my brain wants to be distracted. Mm. I want to see car chases. That's what I want. If I'm left on my own with my head, that's where the trouble yeah. starts. Yeah. <laughs> so for some people, mindfulness works, meditation works, all of that stuff. For me, uh, podcasts have saved my life. I listen to podcasts all the time. I was on four and a half, five hour train journey today. It's all about the podcasts. What were you listening to? I was listening to several things. Uh, oddly enough, there is, and this is what I love about podcasts, there's a podcast called These Are Their Stories, which is about law and order. Oh. And it's about people talking about law and order, about the episodes I've just seen. And so I listen, which is just, <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing, but I listen to true crime podcasts. Yeah. Again, 
My anxiety is I'm terrified of the world. Mm. Yeah. I, my mother told me if I left the house, I was going to die. And yet I will listen to every true crime podcast about the most brutal things that have ever happened to anyone. And there's been some really interesting articles written about why women love true crime podcasts quite as much as we do, because women love true crime podcasts, even though we're the ones who are generally <laughs> attacked. <laughs> but podcasts, because then when I'm wandering around my house in the morning, I get up at five o'clock every morning because I can't sleep. Podcasts in, I'm not left alone in that horrible moment mm. at the start of the day worrying about things. So podcasts have absolutely saved my life. And the noise of it as well, that means that you can sort of, it, it sort of fills the air as well, doesn't mm. it? The Silence is the worst thing in the world for me. Silence is awful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I sometimes, I have a weird relationship with social media for this reason, because although it obviously, and I've written about it, like social media can be a massive stress, it can eat up time and it can, you get some horrendous people being horrendous to you on social media, but it, it's distraction and occasionally distraction can, can do it, mm -hmm. can, can, can work for you. Mm -hmm. I also like horror movies. Me too. What is I like, everyone assumes if you've got anxiety, <coughs> you wouldn't like horror movies. But um, yeah, I, I want to see the new It, which I haven't seen yet, because apparently it's say. really long. Is it? I, yeah, it's like three and a half hours. Yeah, it's a long one. It's a long one. Yeah. But I like the first bit. Yeah, yeah. Except uh, for the end where, he become, it, that, where it loses the thread. Spoiler the alert. <laughs> <laughs> In case you haven't yeah. seen it. I mean, it was weird. Tonally, it was weird. Yeah. Because it's like half yeah. stand by me and half sort of like... But does the clown frighten you? Sorry, no. do Tim, you mind if we... Tim Curry frightened me more than that yeah. clown frightened me. For yeah. some reason, Tim Curry without the special effects was more frightening than, <laughs> yeah, than that one he actually, <laughs> yeah. you know. But does the... But is, it, what, what I'm wondering is, is the... In reality, does, mm. this, does the clown actually frighten you? Is that the, the thing that makes it easy to watch a horror movie is because none of these things in, re in reality have that kind of impact? Uh, also, that. and weirdly with me, because like when I was ill, I used to imagine so many horrific things. I like watching horror movies and be comforted that other people can imagine horrific things and that uh, it's sort of like you're dealing with the demons um, mm. in real life. I, I can't know. watch any... I'll watch a lot of horror, but I can't watch Home Invasion Films. Oh no! Right, right. Right. That, there, that's where I, draw, like, I draw the line at that. Right. I think there's a cruelty to them, isn't yeah. there? It's sort of not and also, I lie in bed at night and I've got five cats and they run around and I think, is that <laughs> <laughs> is that someone in my house? You know, mm -hmm. is someone going to get me? And I've got a oh, you don't need to know. I've got a plan for what would happen if someone broke into my house. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying, don't break into my house because I've got I've got a plan. <laughs> <laughs> It's as like in, Home Alone. Yeah, as I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> it is exactly like that. There's a dodgy door. You've got a little a, cardboard cut out you. As a, as a qualified ex-lawyer, I know exactly how far I can go with self-defense. <laughs> so. oh. Cool. Take note. Yeah. Um, can, um, uh, can we talk about music? Um, I, I kind of, I, I feel like I know a lot about you, you both and your love of music, but I'm not going to presume anything. Um, and I'm just going to ask you about a piece of music or, or a song or, or an album is really what I'm after for the, for the bonus points that you could actually sit and listen to with complete focus and not skip a track or, or not sort of like go out the room and then come back again. I, th I think, because I was sent these questions, I think I said... Um, the Hamilton soundtrack. You did. I did say. I mean, it changes all the time, but I particularly because Hamilton. We watched. I, watched, I don't know if anyone's seen Hamilton, but we, we saw it as a family, and my kids really liked it. And I, there's well, there's three songs which I absolutely because everyone thinks of Hamilton as as rap, mm. but the three songs that aren't rap I really like a lot. I like. Um, what's it called? My brain is just totally froze, but there's a, a it, it's quite uptown, which is a, a, a beautiful, beautiful song. And I, 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 I love Hamilton um, anyway, um, because it's about forgiveness and it's, it's much more complicated than I thought it was going to be um, when I went. And the second half totally is different to the first half. And the second half for me makes it, and, and I, I, like, I like crying at things and Hamilton, yeah 
makes me cry. There's three songs, and there's one, oh, well, it's Dear Theodosia, which is a song to um, an unborn child, and it gets me every time. And it's, it's very sentimental, but it, it, it's lovely. But also, anything, anything sentimental, like Simon and Garfunkel or Beach Boys, which I, which I just watched myself talk about on <laughs> stage. And um, yeah, all that sort of West Coast melodic, <laughs> soothing mamas and the papas that sort of stuff mellow things right i'm not going to win the bonus point because uh, my attention span means i never listen to okay. albums ever listen to albums so i like and this is often a surprise to people hardcore gangster rap <laughs> i like really really hardcore stuff like probably, 90s stuff probably misogynistic <laughs> horrific and I play it in the car with the windows down, my mini driving around Glasgow, <laughs> thinking that I'm some form of gangster. I love, I love anything that's not, that's loud. So I love dance music. I love loud music. My favourite, the thing I go back to again and again, I suffer, I suffer uh, terribly with uh, self-esteem issues, thinking I'm rubbish. And there is a song which I return to again and again, which my friend played for me once. And it's by a man called John Grant, and apologies for the language, but it's called GMF, and the chorus is, it says, I am the greatest motherfucker that you're ever gonna meet. And it's a really mm. calm song. And it goes, I am the greatest motherfucker that you're ever gonna meet. And I play it sometimes in the mornings, and I stand and I go, right, come on, Calman, get, leave the house. Because it really, as you can tell, yeah. it really, I have to find ways sometimes to leave the house. Mm -hmm. And that song makes me stand and go, you're good enough. So I, I often play the same songs again and again. And that one just, if you listen to it, it's not as horrible as it sounds. It really is about someone saying, this is who I am. And that's, my that's what I won't play at my funeral. Mainly because it'll annoy my mother horrifically. <laughs> That, that, that it's what I wish I was. Yeah. I wish I was that person saying, come ahead. So music affects me emotionally more than anything else, so I sometimes avoid it. Because mm. if you're on a long train journey crying, <laughs> as I am just now, I, I find people avoid you and uh, <laughs> you miss out on the coffee service. So. Um, so I return to that, but I tend to listen to, I do a lot of uh, boxing because I love boxing because it gets all my frustration out and I listen to really hardcore rap songs because my, rather than turn my anger inwards, mm. I try and mm. let it out safely mm. by, by punching a punch bag. I've got a punch bag in my garage and I go out to the garage and I punch it. Yeah. A lot. And rap is about self-confidence, yeah. isn't it? It's it is. totally, yeah. It's who I wish I was. And sometimes when people see, I don't know about you, see you on stage, especially when I did comedy, and they could never understand why I was such an anxious person, it's because I'm a character on stage. Mm. That's a mm. character I yeah. play. And the reality is I was crippled by anxiety. So I'm trying to become that person mm. that I'm not on, that I'm not in real life. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I play songs and I, I go, right, come on, come on, you can do it. And it's a, it's a very gut-wrenching thing mm. to pull yourself up and step outside when you don't want to sometimes, yeah. Yeah. you know? And it's an interesting thing about the, 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 the people that make this music is that often they've considered themselves the underdog and that the language they're yeah. using is beefing themselves up. Yeah. Often the music that you've been, just been referred to, Simon and Garfunkel, people go, I couldn't get laid until I <laughs> wrote music. And this, yeah. is, this is me <laughs> with my confidence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and it gives, and, and music has the capacity to, to almost like acting, and you know, it, it, you, could, you can don another yeah. person, you can yeah. be the person that you can you And you be. share it as well. That's the thing my friend told me about that song. And I love that, that sometimes people can say, and sometimes you hate it. Sometimes you hate the song. Mm. I remember going to see, um, again, Fleet, see Fleetwood Mac and I paid a fortune to get front row tickets. I don't go to concerts because I'm too short. <laughs> I never go to concerts because I can't see anything. It's just a waste of money and it's annoying. 
But I saw I paid a fortune, like thousands, to go stand at the front of Fleetwood Mac so I could have Stevie Nicks twirling there yeah. <laughs> in front of me. And they are superb. I think uh, Fleetwood Mac, mm. if there was one album, it would be... Rumours. Rumours, I think, Shout because that's you. just a superb album from start to finish. And an incredibly emotive one for the people that made it. Oh, I mean, you can, you can feel every personal yeah. issue coming out of that <laughs> album, <laughs> can't you? And again, maybe it's, maybe it's me when I was um, surprisingly single for a very long time, hearing about someone else having lots of sex was probably <laughs> quite because <laughs> it didn't happen to me. So you're both quite funny, um, very, very funny people. And um, laughter, you know, people have often said um, at the most appropriate moments, laughter is the best form of medicine. Um, and I guess it's been proven to be the case, science in some ways. But um, do you both have a comic or a sketch show or a, com uh, or, or a skit, something that's your sort of medicinal thing? Um, I, well, I don't watch many things without my children. Mm. So most of the things I watch are with my kids because my daughter is still quite bad at getting to sleep on an evening. So our evening doesn't really start until about half past 10. And then you're sort of just zoning out. So when I'm actually awake and alert watching TV and laughing, it tends to be at Horrible Histories. <laughs> That's very good, I, yeah. I, I, I do like Horrible Histories. I think it's got, yeah. it's, it's, one of the, it's probably one of the best comedy shows, yeah. full stop, mm -hmm. that's yeah. produced in Britain. Yeah. And it, 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 it's probably that. And just the silly songs about Cleopatra and, um, I watched the movie. The movie's not quite as good, no. but the uh, TV show, yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, I, I enjoy Taskmaster at the moment. I think that's a very good show because it's, it's people... I like to think how I would do it if they ever asked me to do the show. But without question, I'm actually writing an essay for... an essay for Radio 3, of all things. They asked me to write about my favourite thing in the world, and it's an audience with Victoria Wood from 1988. Oh, yeah which I knew off by heart. I had a videotape of it and I rewatched it and it is the most perfect 45 minutes of comedy yeah. anyone I saw that has ever produced, ever. I saw that at the Nottingham um, Theatre Royal. Yeah. Yeah, that's where she ends with Let's Do It, doesn't yeah. she? Yeah, she ends with Let's Do It, but the whole thing, yeah. she says it's her language. It's why I love Joyce Grenfell as well. She says she's in her dressing room and it's got a festoon blind with Jimmy Greaves on it. And it's the fact she says it's a festoon blind. <laughs> she chooses her words so perfectly. Mm. And, she's, and it was interesting, I was writing it, and she stands at the microphone, and I think she was the, one of the last generation of comics that uh, grew up in working men's clubs. There weren't comedy clubs. Mm. So she had to stand in front of a microphone, in front of an audience that really didn't want to see her, because they were even less predisposed to women then, I suspect, than they are now. <laughs> And she just stood there. She was so confident. But it is truly, I rewatched it to write this essay. It is tr every single line in that yeah. is funny, touching, beautiful. And the ballad of Barney and Frida, yeah. let's do it. Mm. Uh, beat me on the bottom of the Women's Weekly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I remember in 1988, I was 14, and that changed my life. I became a stand-up comedian because of that show wow. in 1988 that was the best thing I'd ever seen. So that, to me, will never be beaten in terms of comedy. It is she, and it is, is remarkable. I mean, the references are so dated now, aren't they? But it, it's still timeless when you Absolutely. watch it. Absolutely. Absolutely. She talks the about... Deirdre Barlow. Yes. She talks about, she's got a joke about crossroads in the first two <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and, you know, it's, so it's, bit, it's, it's, it's dated, but yeah. her... And what I loved about her, she tells... That's why I love Billy Connolly. She tells a story that goes on for 25 minutes with random bits. Because I don't tell jokes, I tell stories. But she was just the most extraordinary woman and the most extraordinary comedian, I think, mm. this country has ever produced. Her energy sort of has inspired a lot of... Every uh, single person, every single comedian, especially women, but almost every comedian, is, in, is inspired by Victoria Wood. Mm. She, more than... And I love French and Saunders and Joe Brand, but Victoria Wood was... Because she wrote everything and she was so precise. 
She was so precise that her work... I've got a book of Joyce Grenfell monologues and, and Victoria Wood's monologues work as well off the page. Right, it's more like theatre in a yeah, way, absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. She was just, she was extraordinary. So that, an audience with Victoria Wood in 1988 is the, the, I go back to that again and again. It was brilliant. And why do you think she was so good at it? I mean, what was it that she was doing that sort of made these characters uh, sort of eternal? I think she was relatable but weird. She's actually quite surreal in what she's writing. But you watched her and you felt safe with it. And so she wrote that, that ballad, of, uh, ballad of Barry and Frieda's about a woman really wanting sex mm. and the husband going, I'm not doing it. Now that's actually quite, you know, <laughs> but she makes it... Yeah. Quite, I was laughing with my mum and dad about that. Yeah, she makes 14. it cosy, but it's radical within cosy. Absolutely. And what she also did, I think, was she was never political. Yeah. So you could watch Victoria Wood and, and get away from it. It's this escapism thing again. Yeah. You know, you could watch it and... and nothing about the poll tax riots. Mm. No, in, absolutely. Mm. Nothing about Section 20. Yeah. There was none of that going on. It was just comedy in its purest form. And I think that's really what it is. I mean, I think I wanted to be her friend. Mm. I think if you watched it, you wanted to be her friend. And that's what it was. She's never unkind, is she? With the characters that she's portraying, it's always done with a warmth and a, and a sort of um, a familiarity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, can I can I say disclose something that happened in, in the in an email exchange? Because you mm -hmm. went, "Oh, that's just tricky." When I said, "What what's your favourite thing?" and you went, "Oh, it's tricky," because yeah. you said there's some, something else, but now you've got kids. It's horrible yeah. histories. Am I allowed to say that? Oh well, the other thing. The other thing. Yeah, black books. Yeah. Yeah, Black Books is great as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I used to watch that a lot. And I noticed that the clips from Black Books um, with Dylan Moran and Bill Bailey um, are still very popular on YouTube. Yeah. And um, yeah, and also because, I don't know, because Dylan Moran captures that sort of self-indulgent, self-loathing, mm. sort of literary thing very well. And Bill Bailey was quite new to us then and he was, yeah, he, he seemed quite fresh back then. And yeah, it was just, it was just a great um, situation, surreal comedy. He was quite cool, wasn't he? Yeah, what, <laughs> D Dylan Moran. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, he kind of wanted to be him. Um, but I, saw, I saw Dylan Moran um, live a couple of times, very different experiences, because the first time he had red wine on stage. He was very Bernard Black. He was, he was the part. And then the second time, he was drinking herbal tea, mm. very clean. And it was a totally different, mm. totally different vibe. But, but I, think he, he, I think he's sober now. Yeah. Not, not drinking so much red yeah. wine. <laughs> I mean, do you think that over the years, with family and loved ones, that shared experience of what we appreciate in terms of the arts, particularly comedy, do you think that's changed? Because you've said that, you know, black books, and now we've got kids, horrible histories for slightly different reasons. Not because it's not brilliant, but because it's more of a shared experience. Um, yeah, I mean, I, when I was depressed and when I was suicidal, I, I mean, my main thing, but was even a time I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't listen to music because everything was too stimulating mm -hmm. because my, I had panic disorder. So literally anything, even a magazine, reading a magazine, be too stimulating so at that point the thing that saved me was books and not just any old books it was often books that um, were on my shelf in my um, formerly teenage bedroom because I was back at home living with my parents agoraphobic panic disorder the books on my shelf um, was some sort of university books but it was also children's books like um, The Hobbit Winnie the Pooh I think Winnie the Pooh is the best self-help book mm -hmm there has ever been and it's totally about mental health because um, Winnie the Pooh is sort of constantly looking for answers. You've got Piglet who's got anxiety, you've got Eeyore who's got depression, mm -hmm. you've got um, the owl who's um, got all sorts of things going on and you've got Christopher Robin who's hallucinating it all. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's a total mental health experience and it's the first proper self-help book, I mm. think. 
um, Winnie the Pooh. They even did that book, didn't they, The Tao of Pooh. Mm. I don't know if anyone saw that. Mm. But yeah, stories. And I, I, I was obsessed, and I, I, I thought a lot about this when I was writing Reasons to Stay Alive, about why stories were so important. Because I'd done a degree in English literature, an MA, and I'd been taught to be very suspicious of stories. Going back to Susan's thing about literary snobbery and stuff. It was all about style, it was about postmodernism, it was about, you know, nothing means anything, people look down on characters. When I was ill, all I wanted was a good, old-fashioned story with a beginning, a middle, and an end in that order. And I think what it is, is when you're stuck in a moment in life, you want to believe massively in the possibility of change. And for a story to be a story, something has to change. A character has to change. A situation has to change. Something has to evolve or move on. And so stories became a kind of like faith, something I wanted to believe in, because I, I, I believed I would be stuck in that place forever without any change. And that's pretty much one of the main symptoms for a lot of people of depression. It's that belief that nothing is going to change. Nothing's going to get better. And there's a science behind how that is wrong, because I, I normally like really simple words, but I like one sciencey word. My new favourite word is neuroplasticity. And what neuroplasticity means, it's your brain's ability to change. And it changes through what you read, it changes through what music you listen to, it changes through, you know, just human interaction and living. And that happens to everyone, you don't have to try. You don't have to do some fancy meditation technique for that to happen. That just happens. Our brains change. So none of us are the same person we were before. And I think stories are a big part of that. And we want to believe in stories. But there is, there is, change is a real thing. Change actually does happen. So the hardest question, this is going off on a little bit of a tangent now, but the hardest question I ever get in like a, a Q&A at an author event is, what would you say? You had Andrea. You had parents who were supportive. What would you say to someone who's suicidal, who has no one, has no privilege like you had? What would you say to that person who had no one? It's really hard because I've never been in that situation. But what I think I'd want to say is all, almost what I would have said to me, because at times it didn't matter that I had other people. I felt like I was a burden to those other people. I would say to that person, um, well, yeah, stay alive for other people, but not literally other people. Stay alive for those other people that you will be because you will change. The story of you will change and you'll become um, someone else. You know, you wouldn't have just killed that person at 24, you'd have killed every mm -hmm. yeah. other mm -hmm. version but of it's you. One of, it's one of the things that sometimes, I'm, loneliness is my mm. biggest problem. Or was my, so I met my wife 13, 14 years ago and it, she's great, she's not like me. At all, she's fine. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> she was popular at school and likes herself. She's a remarkable person. Um, pop her in front of the PlayStation and she's fine. She just sits there playing the PlayStation and she doesn't have a problem with anything. She likes herself. She's funny. People like her. No problem at all, which is good because I'm the complete opposite. Um, but before I met her, it was loneliness, absolute loneliness, that was the problem. And. And this sounds really stupid, like I'm an old woman. Back then, we didn't have the internet. So when I was at my worst, there was no internet. Uh, I had three channels on my television in my, my crappy flat, and I was lonely, and I didn't know how to reach out to anyone. Now, it's astonishing. I think even now, if something happened, I, I have things to, wa I, to, things to watch. I have Netflix, I have Sky, I can watch things, I can distract myself. It was the Friday nights when I finished work, shutting the door and knowing I wouldn't see anyone till the Monday morning. Mm. And just that weekend of hell yeah. stretching in front of me. And I didn't have the concentration span. That's why books are not the most, books are not my thing. Because when I, when I was at my worst, I didn't have the concentration span to mm. read a book at all. Um, which is why I rely on visual things or kind of, uh, audio things uh, to to distract me mm. and and money was such a huge issue as well it sounds very strange but one of the reasons I don't have a lot of albums is I when I was a student I couldn't afford any albums I still now covet the bare naked ladies CD that was on import <laughs> and fought for 25 pounds <coughs> I had 15 pounds a week as a student to live on and that was food and drink and everything else so I couldn't I couldn't afford any of that but 
The greatest thing for me, I think, as I get older, is acknowledging the fact that my wife and I are very different people and like very different things. So Game of Thrones, I had to sit through that. It was Either horrific, I, right? Yeah. Richie's read all the books, nerd, read all the books. And she would pause it and go, so the difference with the books. <laughs> <laughs> because she's obsessed with it because yeah, she read yeah. all the books. Now, well, I watched that, but the, one of the good things I think with family is, and I actually think the fact I work away from home a lot is, is very good because I know what I like, I know what helps me, and I think trying to make her like what I like is very... D there's things we watch together, but there's also that point where I go away and I do my thing. I mean, we don't have kids, so I don't have to have mm. things that I'm responsible for. So we're quite lucky in that <laughs> regard. Um, but at the same time, I think also one of the things I, I've... And I couldn't agree with you more. Sometimes I look back at myself and think, I would have missed out on all this. And it's very difficult to say to someone, I was 16 at my worst, if someone had said, you know what, later on, people yeah. will say, what would you tell your 16-year-old self? You'll be on Strictly Come Dancing, Susan. I would have gone, I don't give a fuck, I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to help me. In some ways, that's a false question yeah. to say to your 16-year-old self. One day you'll be dancing the quick step. But that's not going to help me. But at the same time, I do know, and the older I get, I know I'm better than I was. But would it have helped you to know that there would be this person who wasn't so depressed and who was able to I think if you told to me things? I would have to wait 16 years to find that person. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in the meantime, go through a series of very inappropriate women who stole money from me. No, I don't think I would have, <laughs> Fair I don't think I would have helped. But I think... A symptom that I am better than I have ever been is I wasn't very well recently and I was frightened I was dying. Mm. Which is the, it was the most startling mm. revelation. I don't want to die now. I spent so much of my life wanting to die. Yeah. Now I'm going, I don't want to die, I hope I'm okay. Yeah. Which to me says I'm, I'm much better than I used to be. Yeah. And if I could say to if I could say to my younger self, it, I mean, it was shit, I can't, I'm not gonna say to my younger self, you're gonna have a lovely life, because it was shit, <laughs> until about <laughs> late 20s, when I met someone and I started working on myself. Mm. And now it's, it's far better than it was, but then I still do have the mm. days where, mm. but it's better. But I always love it when people say, well, what do you say to your 16 year old yeah. self? It's gonna be awful, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but one day, a man will insult you on the television for your foxtrot. <laughs> 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 it was a good fox shot, Bruno, you bastard! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was the most difficult thing about it, just strictly. I'd done all this work mm. on myself and standing up for myself. And I had to listen to those bastards <laughs> every week. I'd go... <laughs> when I wanted to go, what the fuck are you? Come on! Like, round the back of Elm Street going, come on, let's have a conversation about this, shall we? And instead I had to go, no, you're right, it was awful. It wasn't awful, it was bloody amazing. That's what it was. <laughs> so you weren't philosophical about that then? No, I was, I, well, the thing is you are, because you know what you're doing. I think strictly you're like wartime entertainers. We're parachuted into a world that's falling apart. Mm. <laughs> so that for a, an hour and a half on a Saturday night, people watch some people having a dance. Yeah. It's no more and no less than that. It's no, it isn't, it's no more and no less. But I wanted a little bit of credit for the fact that I'd never danced in my life before. Kevin was a foot taller than me, so they kept talking about my shoulders going up. And I was like, well, I'm reaching up, but what do you want me? <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck here. So, no, it was, it was, one, it was wonderful, but it was a, that was the, that was a, I, I was, in my second book I talk about it, that was the changing point in mm. my life completely. Because I had to confront every fear I had about myself, absolutely, full on. Never done anything that high profile, never done anything where I looked the way I did, where I was trying to be a woman. Mm. Mm -hmm. I've never tried that before. <laughs> so that was, that was a very, so every week when people saw me dancing, they had no idea that the five days before that was a complicated, hysterical, you know, awful thing of could I actually do this? Mm. It wasn't about the dance, the dancing was the easy part. It was the everything else before that that was the difficult thing, that confronting mm. 
every fear about myself. Imagine saying on a Saturday night, millions of people are going to vote about whether they like you. For someone who has crippling anxiety. Mm. Imagine saying, in week one, no one's going to vote for you and you're out. There you are. Love. <laughs> There's every preconception about yourself fulfilled. Yeah, I can't relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> Although, um, I got, you know, Meghan Markle gets loads of flack for yeah. everything. Well, she edited a Vogue issue a month ago and included a chapter from Notes on a Nervous Planet in that. And so anything to do with Meghan Markle gets tons mm -hmm. and tons of exposure. And so every single day, Whatever I wrote, the Daily Mail would write a story about it. And the Daily Express did an article about this, my chapter in this book and said, is this the worst poem ever written? It was about beach bodies and it was about... <laughs> and it wasn't a poem, so the answer was no. <laughs> it's not a poem. It didn't even rhyme or anything. <laughs> and I was getting tons of grief and I don't have that you know I, I've never been on Strictly but I have been on Twitter yeah. and yeah. I've yeah. had opinions on Twitter and there comes and even sometimes Twitter, Twitter things make the newspapers and you just think oh, I was just something I just mm -hmm. had a thought about for about five seconds and I just put it out there and then like 10 minutes later I've disagreed with it and by that point you've got about 10,000 people mm -hmm hating you. I literally once did get 10,000 tweets or something in an hour or someone, hey, and, and yeah, Susan's right, with someone with anxiety, that stuff hurts and gets in. But I think with me, there's a subconscious thing where I try and create, if I've got internal drama going on, I try and create external sort of crap yeah. to deal with. So I can mm. deal with that. Because I, I can remember, I used to live in York and I, the river flooded and it got into our house and everyone thought I'd be so stressed about that and everyone had the sandbags out and it was like it was a big thing everyone was treating it like the blitz or something because <laughs> the river was rising every day and we saw it rising and it literally got in and it and it ruined like we'd just renovated a house so we'd lost like tons of money of the house and everything and uh, Andrew was getting pissed off about it all and I was like ah oh, this is mm. this is relaxing mm. because <laughs> because before then i had been sort of like walking to the local Tesco metro and feeling depression on top of me but because I had something real world external yeah. Yeah. to worry about my sort of like cave person brain switched in yeah. and I could suddenly I, I don't know it helps to have something external to worry about so I sometimes worry that how I use like the internet like on Twitter like with shouty opinions or saying something controversial. I'm doing it deliberately mm. to take my mind mm -hmm. yeah. off internal stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that, is that the kind of... Um, uh, maybe we're all doing that. Maybe that's why the world is in this mess. Maybe Donald Trump <laughs> is, is really, you know... A distraction. He, <laughs> yeah, well, maybe him himself, um, because he's sleep deprived, because he's on his phone at three in the morning, maybe the world would just be so much safer if he found like six hours of really good therapy. Yeah. And or a box set. Or a box, or a box set. set. Maybe you could watch the West Wing and find out how yes. a president <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 I mean, but isn't that isn't I mean I hope you're gonna you're gonna argue back here a little bit, but isn't isn't that what um art is? It's a it's a bunch of stories told in different ways. Isn't mm -hmm. that what you're trying to engage with? for a moment in time is another story. Yeah, I mean, it's a great thing. It's, um, I, I, it's Scottish people notoriously, not saying that you're not either, but stories, storytelling is something that I think people do well. I mean, Billy Connolly is a storyteller. That's mm. why he's so tremendous. He tells stories. And I just think what, what any personal experiences are fantastic told. And I love comedy because I used to do some courses for some kids that had been in care. And the reason why comedy is so good because it's a spoken art and it's spontaneous is you don't need to have literacy to do it. You just say it. 
And so you would say to people, tell me your story, and they say it, and you don't need that embarrassment of writing things down or references or whatever it is, they just see it. And, and I think, to me, that's why comedy is my favourite art form in all of its uh, genres, is that you can have the very specific, high fluting comedy, mm. but then you just have kids yeah. saying stuff. One of my favourite things, I did some um, comedy with some people with mental health issues, of course I did, and a woman was telling me a story about when she was in the psychiatric hospital. They had a disco to cheer everyone up because that's what you do when people are mentally ill. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone danced differently depending on what pills they were on. <laughs> and she told me this incredibly brilliant story of how you could tell they were on that drug and they were on that drug and that was there. And it was the most wonderful thing because she was just telling me about it. It was yeah. the story. Yeah. And I always find um, the honesty of a story however that is, mm. um, and just listening to other people, there's nothing, the main thing I think is that we've kind of stopped listening to each other, you know? Yeah. And that's why stories are so good because you listen to someone else's story. And, and also like one of the problems on social media is often the people, if you, people are listening to it, especially young people, they're listening to sort of very strange people, very eccentric people, like mm. people they would not meet in real life. Mm. Like, like, I mean, I've got nothing against them, but like on Valentine's Day, the most viewed internet post in the world on Valentine's Day was Kim Kardashian's post. And her post was about Kanye West oh, yeah. had basically kidnapped Kenny G, the um, musician from the 80s. Well, he'd got Kenny G in the living room playing jazz flute in the Kardashian's <laughs> living room where there's no furniture in the Kardashians' living room. Well, there wasn't on Valentine's Day, but it was just loads of vases with roses in, all laid out across the floor, like attached to trip wires, in case <laughs> Kenny G tried to escape <laughs> the room. And like, she was just saying, oh, you know, just like, oh, you know, my husband's so romantic. And I was just thinking, if you're like, if it's a rainy day, as it would be in February, and you've just been to Clinton's Cards, and... <laughs> You're at the bus stop and you go on Instagram mm. and the first thing you see is this house in LA with this Grammy Award winning 90s, 1980s light jazz saxophonist being played. You think, mm -hmm. why can I have kidnapped Kenny G? Mm. Or why, <laughs> why didn't someone kidnap that yeah. for me? And, and like, that's, that's the age we're in. So like, people are, are forgetting what real, real life is and the people around them. And with, comparing ourselves People to think, yeah, I do a kids quiz show and they have application forms from the quizzes. I've seen that. And all I've of the that. top class, top we, class. We like that in our Yeah, house. top class is good. It celebrates the geeky kids, which I think is important. But the application forms are always like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a YouTuber, I want to be an Instagram influencer. And you sit down and you go, that's not a job, love. That's not a job, <laughs> right? That's not going to help no. you. Uh, one or two people make a million pounds from Instagram posts, but that's not a, that's not a bloody job. And I've got a niece who's uh, six or seven or eight, one of the three. Um, she's she's no. about that age. <laughs> and I, uh, my, my entire life is now directed to mm. a certain extent about this. My, my nephew will be fine. He's a boy. He'll be fine. She is the prime target for all this nonsense of not getting herself an education, of listening to people. The main thing, genuinely, I've been listening to a lot of books about body positivity. There's a lot of women writing a lot of great stuff about how we are as women and how we're perceived as women. And I see it in her already. If I could, have, if I could count up the amount of hours I've spent thinking I am horrific and fat and awful, I would have 20 years of my life back. Mm. And, and I think trying to, trying to get these kids, boys as well, I have to say, I was joking, but boys as well, they, they will grow up potentially hating themselves from the age of four or five because they're watching these people. Mm. Nobody is like that. These people no. are not real. Mm. These people are not real. And now people have got a chance to make themselves not real. Like they've mm. got all these apps that can give you a six pack, that can change your face shape, that can make you have smooth skin, like you've got no pores. Uh, yeah. And it's happening all the time. They did this experiment earlier this year where they took a load of teenagers, they gave them five minutes with all the apps that are, are available for like selfies and stuff. And the only brief they gave them was make yourself social media ready. And every single one of them, not only put all the makeup filters and everything else, this is boys and girls, they 
change the shape of their face. They change the shape of the face. Uh, also this year, and this isn't in LA, this was in London, there was a woman who went to her plastic surgeon and asked the plastic surgeon to make her eyeballs bigger. So she looked like her Snapchat photo with big Bambi eyes. And the plastic surgeon says, we can do a lot, but we can't make <laughs> human eyeballs yeah. bigger because they've evolved to be that size for a reason. You know, there's certain mammals who have big eyes. We're not, we're not that, you know. We, we encourage, marketing just tries to make you miserable all the time mm. so it can sell you stuff because we've kind of got everything we need. So it has to constantly make you miserable and say, ah, oh, you need to sort your lines out on your face or you need to sort your body out, you need to sort this out. So it can just keep on. So, so actually to be calm and happy with who you are takes a sort of like act of rebellion. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what the heck is wrong with us then? Like, is, it, is, it, is this the problem? Is this where the stories stop because, and the art form stops but because everybody's tried to manipulate? There's everything. never been so much confusion around no. stuff. Stuff, 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 you know. Here you go, Instagram, social media, whatever, there. And the greatest battle in my life is accepting myself for who I am and being happy with it. Mm. That is it. That is the bottom line. If there was one thing, I am Susan and I'm okay. That is, that is it. Mm. And all of the body positivity stuff is all about... New, all the political stuff I get, all the feminism stuff I get, and I agree with it about we're being sold, the image, it's all about billion pound industries, I get all that, but fundamentally that doesn't help me in the morning. Mm. So for the, I'm doing a new show and I need 29 outfits and it was the worst day of my life <laughs> to have to go in to try and find 29 outfits in shops mm. where a size 16 won't go across my arms in some shops and then you think i'm awful look at me i'm hideous and i'll go on telly because what happens to me is if there's a fat person and i use that in terms of their terminology if there's a fat person someone will send me a tweet saying i didn't realize susan Kalman was on the telly and i'll get photographs no one ever sends me a picture of angelina jolie and goes oh i didn't know susan Kalman was in a film <laughs> it's always f fat people that they think they think is fat not me and I'll go on telly and I know they'll look at me. So I know at every second they're looking at me. I'm buying this cl these clothes so that someone will call me a name. And I have to battle every day to not listen to it and say, I am... It's that thing, if the uh, J.K. Rowling said it, is being fat the worst thing someone could be. And for, for me it is. Because my entire life I've been told that mm -hmm. so that's that's the battle with all this stuff yeah, yeah. watching everything on television and instagram of saying i am four foot ten there is very little that can be done with me if i was six foot i'd be a size 12 i'm a tiny squashed person <laughs> that is this shape and genetically this is it and i can be healthy and i can be happy but genuinely if i could stop spending three hours every day mm. hating this I would be a happier person. So that's my, my personal battle for 2020 is to stop hating this and start saying it's okay. Well, we think you're lovely, Susan. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> thank you for being here and thank you so much, Matt no, and thank Susan. You. Thank you. Have thank a lovely very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.